Good evening, everyone. Welcome on this sort of Halloweenish night outside. Lovely to have you here this evening where it's warm and dry, and we're going to have a wonderful evening together. My name is Michelle Bogue Trost. I'm the pastor here at Central United Methodist Church, and on behalf of this congregation, I welcome you to this time and this place and the first of our hopefully long, long, long organ concert series. Tonight, we feature Tim Smith, who has rebuilt our organ, and I am so delighted to share this night with you all. You may have noticed there is um, some activity down below us. We are sharing space with a Girl Scout troop, and they're having a Halloween party. So if you hear stray Girl Scouty sounds, it's not ghosts, it's not spooky in any way, it's just Girl Scouts in the basement. So once again, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Psalm 100 entreats us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, and tonight we will deliver on that. My name is Jeff Heald, and it's my pleasure to add my welcome to Michelle's. I served as the church's liaison to Tim throughout this project, and I am truly over the moon to have arrived at tonight. Relieved, but over the moon. We had plans to do this in April of 2020. That didn't happen. I'm so glad we're here tonight. I do have some housekeeping to share with you tonight. You all sat very well where there is no string, so thank you for that. Um, and I appreciate that you are all masked and ask your co cooperation in remaining masked throughout the evening. There are attendance pads down the center aisle end of the pews, and I would ask that you complete those legibly and put your phone number there. That is what we will use to contract, contact trace if we should need to do that. Once everyone in the pew has signed that, if you could just tear it out and leave it on top, we'll pick that up after the concert. If you need a restroom tonight, if you go out that door to the end of the hall and turn left, you will find them. If you go out this door and down a flight, you will find one there as well. You may also find yourself in a Girl Scout party. Choose your door. Lots of folks help make tonight possible, and you see their names on the back of the program. I would particularly like to thank the folks in the sound booth back there, um, Reverend Mark Marino. Our concert is being live streamed tonight, so I welcome that audience as well. And it will also be available recorded uh, on our uh, YouTube channel as well. Um, but Mark is there along with Knud Hansen and Nate Trost and really appreciate all that they're doing to make that possible tonight. We also have some guests here that I would like to acknowledge. I'm looking for John Holt. John, welcome. John is the Dean of the Binghamton Chapter of the American Guild of Organists. Um, as I put together the slides for the program tonight, I was purposefully optimistic, as Michelle pointed out, this is a concert series. When you have a concert series, you have more concerts. Um, I'm already working with Tim, beating the drum a bit to have him come back and do another. One thing we'd like to do in our next concert is wheel that baby out front and center. So part of his work was, in fact, to enable that, and it is theoretically possible, um, but we're going to give that a test run before we try it. Um, so unfortunately, that won't happen tonight, but next time it will. Um, John and I were in talks also in 2020 about hosting the AGO member recital here. Um, that was going to be in June of 2020. Um, so obviously that didn't happen, but hopefully sometime soon. That would be awesome. Um, and I know there are others in the room that could probably pull off a concert as well. Um, let's talk. And on that note, let me also introduce Jean Hensler, who is the subdean for the chapter. Hi, Jean. Um, Jean served here as organist at Central some time ago. We will not count those years, right? I know hearing this tonight will mean a lot to you. I would also like to introduce Helen Smith, Tim's mother, 
Hi, welcome. I think her official title is Chief Assistant. On any given day, she could be found helping with the tuning, waxing and polishing the wood grids, or gosh knows what else. You are remarkable. We are taking a free will offering tonight, the basket in the center in the back, um, and that will be uh, go towards the organ maintenance fund. I mean, I don't know what could possibly go wrong after the work Tim has done, right? We appreciate your support. Well, I think that's enough for me. It is time to welcome tonight's headliner. You can see from his biography in the program that Tim gets around. He currently serves as the organist and choir master at Trinity Memorial Episcopal in Binghamton. He leads organ building projects all over the place. Whenever I have a chance to talk to him by phone, it always is prefaced by, and where are we today? And it's usually on the way from point A to point B somewhere. After working with him closely over these last three years, though, I'm, I'm mostly um, honored to be able to also introduce him as my friend. So without further ado, please welcome Tim Smith. opera Aida is indeed one of the grandest things that Verdi ever wrote. In fact, it's so grand that it includes elephants coming onto the stage. Due to the supply chain crisis, the elephants couldn't come tonight. So you heard French music instead. I'm sorry, that wasn't Verdi at all. If you're not an opera person, that wasn't Verdi. It was Louis Couperin from the grand French tradition, uh, just before I think all the heads were getting cut off and people were wearing lots of big robes and there was lots of bright gold. And so that was called Chacon, it's a grand entrance. 
Um, but we do continue with everything that's on the program tonight. And uh, the next pieces were actually not written by Suzanne Van Solt, but she is a, um, she was a music student in Amsterdam. Her family moved to London in the late 1500s and you couldn't buy music uh, as a student. So you had to copy down what your teacher had for written music and you took that copy and, cop and made, it, made it for yourself and whatever the teacher said, you need to learn this next. So these are pieces that are actually uh, highlighting music that was very active around 1595 in, in Holland, in England, in Spain, and Denmark. And if in the program, you may see a list of stops, the stop list, the specifications for the organ. That's like when you go to, the, to an orchestra concert and there's a list of all the players. Or if you go to the high school play and it lists all the people who are in it and the people who work behind the scenes. Well, that's listing each one of the sets of pipes that are in the, in the chambers up here. I guess this moves, doesn't it? I could stand up straight. Um, and so you will hear uh, a contrast, especially of th three of the more uh, quirky stops in the organ. One is the bassoon that lives on the Great Division. Another is the cor anglais, English horn, that lives in the choir. And then the third one is the oboe that is in the swell. And so those are some of the most uh, peculiar, interesting sounds that you'll hear out of the organ. And those will contrast not only in these pieces, but in the, in the Bach piece next.
I believe we're to sing a hymn now. Uh, after the hymn, I uh, just wanted to speak about a couple of the pieces you'll hear. For those of you who came because it's a Halloween program and you're wanting your money back, <laughs> that was sort of an attempt to be scary. Okay, the last two pieces are really good Halloween pieces. So I'll just say that to look forward to. A little word about Horatio Parker. He uh, was born in the 1860s and was a real homegrown American composer who had quite a career in New York and New Haven and Boston as a conductor, composer, and, uh, and performer. And he, he was such a big deal in his day as so many of us you know, hear about people like that. And this would have been, uh, he died in about 1919, I think. But this piece really embodies the spirit of uh, the country about the time this building was built, which would predate this organ and the way this chancel was. This building is, um, is older uh, than the, when the organ came in in 1951. And so it's, it's good to remember our roots a little bit and hear this, uh, hear this distinctive American language. So that's coming up in just a little while. But the hymn is available in the book and on the screen. That's amazing. Okay, it's your turn. In case you're wondering, yes, I do have the best seat in the house. <laughs> the insert in your program has some details about the renovation project um, that we did for the molar, along with its new specifications. But as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I thought we'd do a little show and tell on some steps along the way to how we got here tonight. So this first slide 
shows a before and after of the inside of that pipe chamber. So on the before, you can see on the left how there are shutters that are closed. And next to those shutters and between the shutters and the chancel area, there used to be a big heavy cloth that protected the pipes and the whole chamber from dust. You can see in the after picture, which is a slightly different angle, it's from there looking out, the shutters are gone and the cloth has been replaced by a very fine metal mesh. So you can see pretty dramatically the difference and, and hear it in the clarity of the sound. Um, and if I stand here, now the lights in the chamber are off, but even as I stand here, and if you would come up afterwards, you can see um, all the pipes now on both sides. You can also see, one more thing, the back ones, I'm sorry, at the very top on the after, um, those are the high notes of our new trumpet, um, which you've been hearing a little bit, and then along the bottom, that's also uh, the rest of the rank of the new trumpet uh, ranks that we have. Okay, um, the next slide, these are both after pictures. So on the left are a new set of shutters that are inside that chamber that are just around the pipes for the choir division. So we can, so the grate comes out freely, um, but the crescendo pedal, the, the pedal will help us with the shutters um, for just the choir division there. And then on the right, uh, so Tim and I have joked with each other that we probably need to start a course on Weight Watchers if we're going to continue to service these pipes. That plank down the right side is probably a foot wide and those new shutters are on the right of that. So trust me when I say it is a bit of a, a squeeze to get through there, and then there's a plank that you see in the front that helps get to the, to the uh, trumpet ranks that you can see on the top. Um, so yeah, it's a tight squeeze, and we made it tighter. Um, and on the next slide, so this is three pictures. So as many of you know, an organist most distressing issue is a cipher. You can tell. Um, so there's nothing worse than turning on the organ and a pipe decides it's gonna make noise whether you want it to or not. Invariably, the offending pipe is hard to find and harder to get to. Um, so what I'm showing here is one day I came in and it was the tierce that had the offending pipe. So if you look at the leftmost picture on the right, you see a rank of pipes that seems to be about two feet lower than all of the rest of them. That's because it is, and those are the tiers way down there. So that's where the offending pipe was. So that little bit of plank that you see is what I had to slide onto on my belly, yes, to get to. Now the middle picture shows the aerial view of that. You can see the pipe laying across the wood on the bottom there, that was the bad boy that was refusing to be quiet. So the sum total of my repair skills are pull the pipe out and make it stop. Um, to do this, some organists are very good at improv, I am not. However, that little tool on the right I think deserves a patent. That is a wooden plank that I found at my legs and my face mask. And by taking this instrument and touching each tierce pipe, I was able to figure out who was making noise. I think there's a market for this. Um, so, but it's back in place and behaving now. On the next slide, when I say that the console was gutted, the left shows the console was gutted. Um, and you can see on the right, it's getting back into shape a little bit with, with two of the manuals put in. But the, the main part of the work that was done here was to the console um, and digitally, digitally enabling it to be uh, controlled. On the next slide, you'll see what that entails. So now, on the left side is a side view of the console. That's all the computer circuitry that's now there that's helping control everything. And on the right, shows the other end of the computer circuits up in each chamber 
um, so that everything can talk together. And I'll just say, so many wires and so much soldering, I think it was a full three months that every time I came in here, someone was soldering. Um, it, was, it was a lot. Um, and on the next slide, okay, these are the most unglamorous photos in the set. Um, I have heard that there are churches who did major renovations on their organ and chose not to replace their organ blower which creates all of the wind. Tim might be able to tell us a story or two about ha what happens when you do that. I beg you to ask him. Um, we did do that, and on the right, what you should notice is how much smaller the blower is. It's actually out now in its own little house. Um, there's actually a, a piece that goes on the front of it as well, but it's this tiny little thing. It's like when you replace your furnace after 20 years and suddenly it was this and now it's this. Same with our, our blower, and it's brand new, and it works great. And on the next slide, uh, this is the final before and after I have. So this is the before and after of the console itself. It's kind of hard, um, probably brighter on your screen than what I'm able to see. Um, but you know, among the changes, a new music stand with LED lighting, more stops, more couplers, Pistons above the pedals, 99 memories, the ability to transpose, it's all there. So I'd like to acknowledge for a moment all of those folks, many of who uh, in the room tonight, who volunteered their time to this project, um, whether you insisted in helping take all of the pipes down and, and put them aside while we did all the re-leathering, um, or you helped with one of the fundraising dinners, or in any way you lent your talents. Um, also, those who contributed financially, yes, this was a major undertaking. I was shocked how quickly we raised this money. It was so impressive and, and just a testament to Central's commitment to fine music. There is a plaque over here on the wall that um, acknowledges all of those donors, and it is actually on an antique organ pipe. Now, COVID protocols suggest we're not quite ready to host a reception with a meet and greet and all that. Uh, but in lieu of that, I conned, I mean, I asked Tim if he would be willing to do a Q&A session after the concert. So we will sit here um, and we will be like Phil Donahue and such, and um, we'll, we'll, he, he will take your questions. So think about it. Um, don't make them too hard. Um, but for now, we welcome Tim back to the organ.
everything every minute. You should Google the story about the funeral march of the marionette. It is hysterical. It is the most overdone, complicated little story, and that music goes with it. That music also is associated with, for those of us who watch black and white television, with um, Mr. Hitchcock himself. But, but the piece is really, the story is just crazy. This next piece is as Halloween as any organist can possibly get. Most of us began in high school saying, I want to play this piece. Well, it happens that it shows off a whole lot of the organ. So thank you very much for coming. I haven't said a thing about the, all the wonderful people who helped with this project. I guess we're saving that for the Q&A in a little bit. So enjoy the Boilman.
We may have seen Girl Scouts fleeing from the building. <laughs> Thank you. You are my friend. So, I've got an easy one to tee up, then it's your turn, um, and I will rephrase the question for the benefit of the folks that are watching on the internet so they can hear it through the mic. So keep your questions at my level, not his, um, so that I can do that well. But Tim, what I'd like to ask you is, you didn't see all the pictures, but you lived through it. In this project, what were the unique challenges you faced to get this organ to where it is today? It's a bit like remodeling a house while the family is living in it <laughs> and sitting down to eat breakfast each morning and you're working around them and trying not to annoy them too much, but uh, the organ was designed in a factory uh, and built there and then brought here from Hagerstown, Maryland and fit into this space. And then when we decided we wanted to take things out to refurbish them or to move them around and change them, it turned out that they had had the privilege of putting it in in a very luxurious manner without the grills in place and uh, sort of in the right order. And while we redid much of the organ, we couldn't remove the, removing the entire instrument would have been $300,000. Did we spend that much? Not quite. Okay. Not quite. It probably seems like it. <laughs> Might. But um, to take everything out would have been yeah. uh, impossible. So we had to uh, work around things, which is why I went through more staff on this project than any other in 25 years, because people burned out on crawling around inside. Uh, but there were a lot of wonderful folks who did very, uh, very acrobatic, athletic uh, tasks in, in hard to get to places. And, and the pipes as they came out, uh, someone asked me this question recently, they assumed that we took the grids out and all the pipes came out through you know, that seemingly large opening. I don't think we took any pipes out that way. They all came out through the trap door that's behind these rooms that's about this big. <laughs> it, it's about as big as the... Maybe. The uncovered part of this table. Yeah, yeah, right. There's one on each side. Yeah. So, yes. Your turn. Anyone have a question for Tim? I wanted to give a disclaimer before there's a question. Uh-oh, okay. I was more the organ builder than the performer tonight. So for those of you who play really well and know how all these pieces go, my sincere apologies that I couldn't get all the notes together. But that last C major chord was really in tune between both sides. So that was my pleasure more than playing all the notes correctly. Okay, I'm done. Who would have known? Questions? Yes, in the back. The question is about the uh, former carillon that we had there, and I can tell you that it is no longer there. We did have it removed, and Tim will tell us something about that. The, the carillon was uh, a, a sort of mid-20th century uh, invention. by the, It was electronic, and it was done by uh, the Schulmerich Company in Pennsylvania. They make a lot of handbells. And they uh, constructed uh, a system where not the sound of bells would actually be transferred through speakers and play from the tower. And there was a small clavier that was on over here mm -hmm. um, that was to play those. 
but those systems uh, relied on vacuum tubes and a lot of things that we respect but don't necessarily maintain over the years. Um, and the speakers are subject to pigeons. But um, the chimes are still here, and those are real chimes. And my apologies that I didn't work that into the program, but I'm guessing if you come to Christmas Eve here on Silent Night, you're going to hear those. Might hear those. But they, they live up in the uh, arch and over the, uh, in the rear of the church, and there are 25 tubes, very much like you'd see on the orchestral stage. Um, and we, uh, we had a, that was another big challenge, was that there's a cable <laughs> from here that goes to there. And in the midst of the project, uh, the cable was compromised. So it's a small miracle that those chimes from 1951 up there still play from here. And I discovered that those chimes weren't playing one Monday, Thursday evening when we typically end the service with the tolling of a bell. There was no bell. So um, it didn't happen that night, but it will next time. Thank you for that. And, and by the way, the carillon um, had been out of service for some time prior to us taking it out. So I don't, I don't remember the last. And it had, we had rolls and rolls of, of music that it would play through. Um, but yeah, it hasn't worked for a while. There was another question on this side. Yes. Uh, I'm not an artist, okay? So That's okay. So the question is of the difference between a molar organ and the Casavant that is at Trinity. There are several molars in the Tri-Cities and there are several Casavants in the Tri-Cities. Casavant is uh, a company that started in Canada and in Quebec about 1890. Molar is a company that started in Hagerstown, Maryland uh, about 1880. They were somewhere else, but they ended up in Hagerstown. Um, Moeller uh, came from more of a Germanic mindset. Uh, uh, Matthias Moeller himself was a Dane, and so his training was from Germany when he came here to start building organs. Uh, the Cassavant's uh, brothers were, as you can imagine, of French extraction. And so uh, both companies experienced uh, boom and bust, as, as so many corporations do, um, and the Moeller company in the 50s was uh, continuing to flourish. The Cassavant company in the 50s was struggling. And around 1960, uh, the Cassavant company uh, got an infusion with a whole new artistic direction. And the Moeller company slipped in the 1970s. <laughs> so it's, it was a back and forth. Cassavant is still going. Moeller is not. Cassavant has built 4,500 organs. Moeller built 13,000 organs. A lot of the, the question about the tonality of the two, a lot of that was influenced by the period and the, uh, to the customer, it, it, to some degree, what the demands were. Uh, but, but it's d definitely that this came out of the Germanic and English um, style, and the uh, Cassavant has remained uh, French, which uh, those speak to the, uh, oh, the sonorities that you hear in some of the reed stops, the nature of the flutes, um, and uh, to some degree, the room in which the organ speaks. Uh, so, uh, it's a richness that's in the Tri-Cities that we have a variety of instruments uh, built relatively at the same time, but that have different characteristics. This organ, I think, um, it leans, it comes out of its orchestral history, and you heard uh, some of the big bass in this organ that is uh, evoking a lot of what the Moeller Company did over the years. Cassavant uh, became more uh, Baroque uh, shortly after this organ was built. Our project was to 
bridge over a little of that artistically because we want an organ in the 21st century that can play a little bit of everything. And that's um, what we aspire to do here. Yeah. Thank you for that. Another. Yes, sir. This organ was built in the 50s. And if I had a 1950s car, I could probably repair most of it. Uh, a car today, I don't even know how to do when I open up the hood because there's so much stuff underneath it. Is this organ more repairable and maintainable than the old one? I know a lot of that. I mean, a circuit board in there that keeps you control everything. Is it one circuit board? That's a great question, and it's on... Uh, with all of the circuitry now that is in the new organ, is it more repairable or harder to repair? And is there an analogy to the way cars are between 1950 and, and today? That's a tough question. <laughs> well, the mechanism uh, that both Moeller and Casavan and all of the other companies were using up until the 1970s was actually uh, wind power and electric magnets. If you can picture the inside of a player piano, which is bewildering, that the player piano works on a vacuum principle but uses wind pressure. And that's how this organ's switching system was. If you see the size of the console, it has quite a bit of depth. It's a large cabinet. And it was chock full mm -hmm. of air. There was air pressure actually going into the organ console. And the air pressure was helping to push the stops on or pull the stops off. The air pressure upstairs was opening the shades and closing the shades, turning stops on and pulling them off. And so the, the number of con, uh, contrivances, I would call them, devices that were developed in the teens and the 20s continued in these factory organs to be used through the 50s and into the 60s. And they are wonders of, of, of mechanical ingenuity, but they're incredibly bulky and very complicated. And to restore them is a, is a noble art, which some companies do that, but you are maintaining um, thousands, tens of thousands of dollars worth of little leather valves uh, inside beautifully shellacked boxes that are airtight and these tubes running everywhere. Whereas, and, and the result of that system is a very limited number of controls for the organist. So if you were watching on the um, console cam, uh, when I pushed a button, the stops would move quickly. Well, we have at our disposal uh, uh, 1,200 combinations now that we can use. 100 levels of memory, mm -hmm. 12 generals, and more than that, actually, because there are some other things. The old organ had six combinations. So you could set up six different types of sound in the organ, and that was it. But we've gone from six to 1,200. So we've compromised having that original, interesting, DeSoto-like 1950s amazing stuff but we've gone to something that's simpler, and the circuit boards that you saw pictured, um, and I get very nervous in this town ta telling anybody anything about a circuit board. <laughs> but I do know they're about this big, and there are eight in the console, and four in that chamber, and three in this chamber. And they have little jobs to do, and they do them well, and if it goes bad, it's a few hundred dollars and it gets replaced. Why would it go bad? Well, churches do get hit by lightning. We had a church in Ohio that lost the switching system in the organ, but they, they lost all of their audio video equipment, the office, it was, a, it was a disaster. And the static electricity stayed in the organ for about a year. But they had a spire on the church. You have a spire? I don't think you do. You have a square tower. It's a square, yeah. Don't get a spire. Okay. Don't get a spire. Um, I'll add a little bit to that. Curious if you would agree with this. Um, some problems can happen the same with this organ as the organ 10 years ago, like a cipher, if a pipe gets unhappy. 
Um, but sometimes there are problems that we're not quite sure where to look first. So I think the troubleshooting is, is perhaps a little more adventurous sometimes. I What was the last problem we were working on and, and someone was on the phone and you know, there's software involved, there's the programming of it, there's the actual board itself, there's the path to the pipe. So the troubleshooting's a little different, I would say. The troubleshooting is better because in the 1950s, there was a wire uh, for every key on the keyboard times three keyboards t plus the pedals plus every stop plus the shades and the chimes all going f underneath the console, underneath the chancel, up into the chamber. Mm. So that was a bundle about this thick of, of wires. Every one of those wires was white. White. <laughs> With cotton covering on it. Mice eat cotton. So we, the, our industry changed in the 1970s to telephone cable, which is color-coded. So we all know that white-blue is C and blue-white is C-sharp. And that's true down here and up there and all over the place. So I would say, yes, it's a machine. It's going to have troubles. And we're, but it's a little easier now yep. to figure that out because at least we have um, less anonymity of all those wires. <laughs> and the wire that connects the console now is a fiber optic cable, which is why moving the console out, we need AC power for the lights and a fiber optic cable and that is it. But we'll try it first, before the next concert. Before anyone's here. <laughs> Another question. Jean. Tim, when you explain that we do not have a 32 foot pipe in here, I'm assuming, you do not have a 32 foot resultant pipe, you make it digitally, right? The, the question is on the 32 foot resultant pipe that we heard very very few churches have room for a 32 foot pipe but that's the subsonic um, level where the uh, Hertz is in the around 40 cycles or so and that's the the low rumble everybody's craving especially people in their cars with subwoofers <laughs> So a resultant is, am I, am I on? Yes. I can't hear me. Okay. So the resultant plays a low pipe with another one above it. Um, a fifth away for the musicians. So when we play low C, automatically the organ is playing a G on another set of pipes at the same time. So I'm doing this manually for you. So it gives the, it, it suggests to the ear the octave that's below that simply through the physics of sound. And the, the, um, the convenience that the switching system provides is that obviously you can't tie your hands up or your feet playing two notes at once. Right. So it, it creates that effect. And this is available on a lot of organs, um, but it's not an electronically generated sound. It's still two pipes playing together, but just in a sort of arranged marriage, if you will. It's actually tough to get some of the 16-foot pipes in there, and if the ones that are up against the wall here bend and twist and turn to achieve their 16 feet. Anyone else? I've never done a Q&A before. He's doing okay. <laughs> Going once. Twice. Okay, well. <laughs> Don't go. <laughs> On behalf of your friends from Central, a little something for you and mom to enjoy. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Do we have to share it right now? No, you don't have to share it right now. Oh, that's right. No reception. No reception. Oh, that's but beautiful. Thank you very much.
Once again, Tim Smith, everybody. Mike, thank you for coming and have a good, safe journey home, everybody. Thank you.